I talk about the Liberty Bell, I want to talk about briefly uh, the importance of bells and what they meant in our ancestors' life. They're not just pretty sounds that they heard in the air. Our word bell comes from an old Saxon word, bellan, which means to bellow or holler. Uh, bells have been used in nearly all cultures uh, for centuries. The oldest known examples were from China in 3000 BC, and there's an example there. Bell foundering, or the creation of large bells, has remained the very same since the Middle Ages. Uh, they are composed basically of 71 parts copper, 26 tin, two of zinc, and one of iron. They may also contain a bit of silver, but the composition is the same today in bell manufacturing, as well as the process. We may have some fancy equipment and we have electricity, but the basics have never changed. Uh, we start to see large bells coming into use sometime after the 7th century. The ring in no bells was not only for sacred purposes, but a host of other occasions that were meaningful to the lives of a population. Bells defined and governed your day. They grew to be a part of who you were as a town, and they were part of your soul and identity. Individual bells had names ascribed to them often. Uh, there was a lot of pride that went into bell ownership. They were very expensive to make, and if your town had a peel or a set of bells, it was a mark of prosperity. When a town or province was captured by an enemy, <coughs> bells were one of the first things to be taken. If you deprived a town of its bells, you stabbed it to its core. It was symbolic as well as practical because you cut out its tongue. Bells were the voice of the town, and if you silenced them, it was very degrading. Plus, the captured bells were also often melted down to be used as munitions. Great sets or peels of bells, as I said, were a huge expense, and they took a lot of skill to make. So people felt very personal about their bells. In some countries, they baptized them, just like a person. Uh, there was a case in Russia where a bell was not rung in the alarm when the local prince was captured by an enemy. And afterwards, the populace took the bell down, whipped it, and sent it into exile. <laughs> Prior to the invention of clocks, here's what a typical day might have been like with regard to bells in the town of our ancestors. You might hear the local bells from the monastery reading the canonical hour of prime at daybreak, and that's your alarm clock to rise for work for the day. Uh, in a walled town, butchering had to be finished by a certain hour before the bell tolled to avoid a penalty. In certain towns, you couldn't set your wares to sell or buy until the market bell had rung. A town crier might ring a bell uh, at certain times to announce news to the populace throughout the day. There might be different bells in appeal used for different purposes. Uh, a designated toxin or alarm bell might be used solely to alert people that there was danger or fire, and you would recognize the sound of that bell. Uh, a bell could be rung backwards for the same purpose, lowest to highest as well. One of the bells in the Church of St. Ives uh, in England carries this inscription, when backwards rung we tell a fire, think how the world shall thus expire. <laughs> A passing bell might announce a death in some towns by the stroke of a bell, or which bell in appeal rang. You would know whether it was a man or woman or child, and perhaps even the years of their age. You could pay the church to ring for you an illness. The sound of bells was considered so edifying that they were continually rung during plague in the belief that God might hear that and recognize their devotion and spare them. Curfews were rung at the end of the day, and you'd better be in your home and not up to some mischief. <laughs> the point I want to make is that bells were inextricably woven into the lives of our ancestors. They were their clocks, their newspaper, their very connection to their community. And when old bells in Europe eventually succumb to wear and metal fatigue, uh, they're not scrapped or discarded. They are melted down and recast so. If you are visiting old world countries today and you hear a peal of bells, you are almost certainly hearing the very same bells that your ancestors heard. Literally hundreds of stories and folklore have been handed down or written in nearly all cultures about bells, both true ones and fantasy. And it is a short story that actually gave birth to the uh, fame of the Liberty Bell. Bell was originally cast for the Pennsylvania Provincial Assembly. 
and it was meant to call the Pennsylvania Assembly together, among other events. The capital for the colony of Pennsylvania was Philadelphia at that time and they built a state house there for the assembly to meet in. The original city bell was said to have been brought there by William Penn uh, from the city's founding in 1682, and it hung from a tree behind the state house. And in 1751, they decided to build a bell tower, and the civic authorities wanted to have a bell of, of better quality that could be heard at greater distances because now the city was expanding. <coughs> Isaac Norris, who was the speaker of the assembly, gave orders to the colony's London agent, Robert Charles, to obtain a good bell of about 2,000 pound weight. And quote, we hope and rely on thy care and assistance in this affair, and that thou wilt procure and forward it by the first good opportunity, as our workmen inform us that it will be much less trouble to hang the bell before their scaffolds are struck from the building where we intend to place it, which will not be done until the end of next summer, or beginning of the fall. Let the bell be cast by the best workmen and examined carefully before it is shipped and the following words well shaped around it. By order of the assembly of the province of Pennsylvania for the state house in the city of Philada, 1752 and underneath, proclaim liberty through all the land to all the inhabitants thereof. Leviticus <coughs> chapter 25 verse 10. So Robert Charles ordered the bell from the famous London Bell Foundry of Lester's Pack. They are now known as Whitechapel. They were called Lester and Pack at the time. Uh, for the sum of 150 pounds, 13 pence, and 8 shillings, which included casting, shipping, and insurance. That's approximately $30,000 in today's money. It arrived in Philadelphia in August of 1752 on the ship Hibernia, and it was mounted on a stand so they could test the sound and it promptly cracked. <laughs> so now what do they do? Uh, the assemblyman went running back down to the captain of the vessel upon which it had arrived. And it had not sailed yet and they asked him to send it back, but he was unable to take it on board. Now, the history of the account does not say why. Uh, I'm guessing he either had a full load again already or might have felt uneasy about the weight involved. It was coming up on stormy season. September is notoriously a lot of weather changes in the Atlantic and he's at least three weeks out to get to London, but no one knows. At any rate, uh, two local iron founders, Pass and Stowe, in neighboring New Jersey offered to recast the bell, so the civic leaders gave the miscast bell to them. Now you might ask yourself, why didn't the assembly just have Pass and Stowe cast it in the first place? I mean, they're already in America, but the fact is they were simply iron founders. They really had no experience in bell casting. And besides, I personally think the founding fathers of Philadelphia were like all of us. We, we succumbed to brand names. And Whitechapel or, you know, <clears throat> Lester and Pack at the time were, were the premier bell casters in Europe. And they were considered one of the finest. They're in operation today, and they're still considered one of the finest bell casters. Uh, Pass and Stowe charged 36 pounds for the recast and repaired it. But as I stated, they were inexperienced in bell casting. And, the first recast was not successful, but they had it ready to launch in March of 1753 in the city, scheduled a public celebration with free food and drink so they could test the new bell. And it didn't crack, but one hearer described the sound as two coal shuttles slamming together. <laughs> so the crowd jeered and made fun of them, and so they took the bell away and recast it again. So Pass and Stowe <coughs> decided that maybe the metal was too brittle, and they claimed that they added more copper and had it ready in June of 1753. Rang it again. The assembly still didn't, didn't like the sound of it. However, it's here. They went ahead and put it in the bell tower. Now, why is Philadelphia and Pennsylvania misspelled? The short answer is the spelling was not standardized at that time, and you might even say names spelled different ways within a same document. Uh, so that was not something that was critically important to them. Anyway, they're still dissatisfied with the bell. So Isaac Norris uh, petitioned Robert Charles, their London agent, to order a second bell and uh, to ask them if, if Whitechapel or, or Lester and Pack would credit the value of the metal of the first bell ordered on the bill of the second, and they would just ship it back. They refused. Their stance was they did not make defective bells. It must have been damaged in transit or be run by someone who was inexperienced 
and the clapper was too, roll, too low, so it struck the rim instead of the body of the bell. In May of 1754, the new bell arrived, and everybody agreed the second one wasn't a whole lot better than the first. At any rate, the assembly decided it was easier to just keep both the bells, and they would hang the, the newer one in a cupola on top of the steakhouse to ring the hours with a clock that they had now acquired. And uh, the original bell, quote, would be put to such uses as this house may hereafter appoint. Uh, we know that they used the Pass and Stowe bell to summon the assembly in special events. One of the earliest mentions is by Benjamin Franklin in a letter to Catherine Gray, dated October 16, 1755. Adieu, the bell rings, and I must go among the brave ones and talk politics. Now, at the end of the things, why did the bell fail? Well, it's possible that Whitechapel used crappy metal to make this bell with the thought that, oh, it's just the colonies. We're clear across the ocean. What are they going to do to us? We know from letters written by George Washington that ordering things from Britain were sometimes fraught with dissatisfaction. They would ship things would end up broken or defective or not send what had been ordered. Uh, in, 17, in 1975, the uh, Winter Term Museum performed an analysis on the metal of the original Liberty Bell and concluded that a series of errors had occurred. Uh, there was a much higher level of tin in the Liberty Bell compared with other Whitechapel bells of that era. And it suggests that Whitechapel made an error in the alloy, perhaps using scraps of metal with a lot more tin to begin the base melt instead of the usual copper. They further found that the second recasting, instead of adding copper, Cass and Stone had actually added cheaper pewter, the high lead content, and incompletely mixed it, which creates a less than beautiful sound, causes metal fatigue, and made it easy for souvenir collectors to knock off substantial chunks for trophies from the rim in later years. Um, the bell fell into obscurity for a number of years after that. It's just another city bell with no distinction. We know from documentation that it was rung upon the ascension to the throne of George III in 1760. Remember, we're still British at that time. It was rung for the repeal of the Sugar Act in 1764. Uh, the assembly also allowed St. Paul's <coughs> congregation to use the state house for services while their church building was being built and uh, they used the bell to summon their worshipers for a while. It was also used to summon the populace of Philadelphia to public meetings. However, a group of citizens around that time filed a complaint that they were incommoded and distressed by the constant ringing of the great bell on too many occasions, and would they please desist? <laughs> okay, now we're in the thick of the Revolutionary War. After the defeat of Washington's troop, at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11, 1777, Philadelphia was left defenseless. And as they prepared for what they were sure was going to be an imminent attack by the British, they were afraid that their bells uh, would be taken down to melt into munitions, including the assembly bell. So it was taken down from the tower, sent by guarded wagon, and kept at the Zion German Reformed Church in what is now Allentown, behind a false wall. It was returned to Philadelphia in June of 1778, but by that time, the steeple of the state house was now in poor condition, so it was put in storage and not rung again until 1785 when they rebuilt the steeple. However, in 1799, the state capital of Pennsylvania was moved from Philadelphia to Lancaster. The state of Pennsylvania owned the state house which would later be known as Independence Hall. And they had no further use for the original state house, so in 1816 they sold the land and building to the city of Philadelphia, including the Bells. The city of Philadelphia decided to sell the original second bell from the clock tower that had been ordered from Whitechapel back in 1754. It was sold to St. Augustine's Roman Catholic Church, which was later burned down by an anti-Catholic mob in 1844. Um, the anti-Catholic or Bible riots took place between May and July of 1844 in Philadelphia. Let me remind you, the city of brotherly love. <laughs> <laughs> and it eventually spilled over into some surrounding towns. Uh, this was almost certainly resulting from the, the growing uh, population of Irish 
largely groups of immigrants escaping the potato famine, which was occurring about that time. Someone spread a wild rumor that the Catholics were trying to remove the Bible from public schools. <laughs> and it just got completely out of hand. It became really violent. Uh, I suggest you look it up on your own. It's an interesting story, story and a, 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 a really not well-known part of our history. Anyway, due to the fire, the bell was partially melted. Afterwards, it was recovered and recast. In later years, it was donated and hangs today at Villanova University. Did the Liberty Bell actually crack upon being rung for the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776? No. No. <laughs> well, for one reason, that was the day the document was sent to the printers and the Declaration wasn't read publicly until July 8th, and at that time, a number of bells rang in various cities. It might have been among them, but there's no documentation on that. In the early years of America, the bell was rung on such occasions as the 4th of July, Washington's birthday, Election Day. It was also known to have told at the death of Franklin, then Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton. Uh, it's not certain exactly when it cracked. The bell is mentioned in a number of newspaper articles during the years 1817 to 1846. In 1837, the bell is shown depicted in an anti-slavery publication with no crack showing. Nothing was noted in writing about it having a crack until February 1846, when it was rung in celebration of Washington's birthday. The Philadelphia Ledger takes up the story in February of 1846, quote, the old independence bell rang its last clear note on Monday in honor of the birthday of Washington and now hangs in the great city steeple, irreparably cracked and dumb. It had been cracked before, but was set in order that day by having the edges of the fracture filed so as not to vibrate against each other. It gave out clear notes and loud and appeared to be in excellent condition until noon when it received a sort of compound fracture which put it completely out of tune and left it a mere wreck of what it was. Now some historians believe that a squabble over money led to the final crack. Christ Church in Philadelphia claimed an exclusive privilege of ringing the bells on Washington's birthday as that was the church that Washington was affiliated with when he lived in Philadelphia. And the city paid the church a $30 bell ringing fee for services to the illustrious dead. Well, it seemed that other churches wanted in on the action. Why should Christ Church get the money and the glory? So the debate was played out in the newspapers and the courts, and ultimately it was decided to press the so-called Liberty Bell into service and discontinue paying for bell ringing altogether. Other stories, the most common one is that it happened when uh, it rang on the death in 1835 of Chief Justice John Marshall. Other claims uh, that it was damaged when ringing a welcome to General Lafayette on his return to the United States, or that in 1831 some boys in the town had been invited to ring the bell for Washington's birthday one year, and they inadvertently damaged it, but we don't know for sure. We do know that it was first termed the Liberty Bell, in the New York Anti-Slavery Society's journal in an 1835 piece in which they castigated Philadelphians who were primarily Quakers and were anti-slavery, but they felt that they weren't doing enough for the cause. So they were using the state house bell as uh, an affront to them. The Liberty Bell gift book shown here uh, was an item published yearly from 1839 to 1858, and it was sold to raise money for the cause among other fundraisers, and it had poems and prose and stories written by various authors and was a very popular piece and sold every year. Still, it was not the abolitionists that made it nationally famous, but a short story written by a George Lippert in 1847 in Gibson's magazine. The story titled, Ring, Grandfather, Ring, told of an old bellman who sat in the State House bell tower, and he doubted that Congress would have the courage to break away with England. And suddenly his grandson, who had been secretly hiding away in the rafters, observing the founding fathers, heard them declare independence and raced up the stairs, declaring, Ring, Grandfather, Ring. And the old man pulled the rope, and the mighty clapper rang out its message. And there's George Lipper, handsome fellow. So even though it was totally fiction, this became accepted as fact because everybody just liked the story so much. Uh, George Lipper's a fascinating fellow. 
He was widely read in antebellum America, but I think not a lot of is known about him today. Uh, he wrote a lot of short stories, and he's worth looking up for some more things. That's his grave in Philadelphia. Okay, now, let's go back to 1828. Remember, the state house is now owned by the city of Philadelphia, and they decided once again to reconstruct the state house steeple and install a new clock. It was decided that the clock should have a new bell, which was made by the John Wilbank Foundry, now in the United States, and it weighed 4,000 pounds, twice the size of the original Whitechapel bells. So, as part of his payment, he was supposed to take down and haul away the old Pass and Stowe original bell, but he didn't take it. So the city sued him for breach of contract because he didn't take what would later be known as the Liberty Bell with him. And Wilbanks argued that the cost of draining or hauling that bell exceeded the $400 value that the bell had been assessed at at the time. They're still trying to get rid of that bell. They haggled in court over a long period of time, and finally the judge ordered a compromise. Will Banks would have to pay the court costs, and the city had to keep the bell on the premises of the state house, but it would technically be considered on loan, and Will Banks would retain ownership. Over the years, as time passed, Will Banks' heirs had agitated the city of Philadelphia to give them the bell, which they considered rightfully theirs. Property is nine-tenths of the law. Then in 1915, they, they devised a written agreement with the family uh, to continue to leave the bell on loan as long as it hung in Independence Hall. And there it is in the early days. As recently as 1984, an heir of Wilbank named James McCloskey claimed the bell for himself noting that in breach of the 1915 agreement, the bell had been moved to a pavilion, a block north of Independence Hall. He claimed that he wanted to display it as his rightful property in his hometown of Baltimore, or barring that, to be able to melt it down and make about seven million rings, all with cracks in them, and sell them for $39.95 each. <laughs> I'm sure QVC was standing by. <laughs> Going forward, in 1852, the Liberty Bell was finally brought down from the old steeple where it had been left hanging and was placed in the Declaration Chamber, still maintained in the Independence Hall at that time as picture. Later on, they did move it to a pavilion. Um, so now the Liberty Bell's famous, and for various patriotic displays, here's where the bell begins to travel sometimes just on a rail car or a whistle stop, and sometimes displayed for a period of time in a building or a city park. And the thought behind that uh, was that after the Civil War, they were trying to provide something that made people feel a sense of unity in the United States, and so they were having the bell travel. So it's shown here in 1876 at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Um, in 1885, the bell traveled by train to New Orleans for a world industrial and cotton exposition promoting national unity. I know in New Orleans they like to do these medallions, and they do them for the Mardi Gras too. They have little coins or medallions that they pass out, so we are fortunate to see a copy of that. In 1893, the bell was displayed at the Chicago World's Fair, and it was discovered that the private watchman who was hired to guard it was selling off chips of the bell to people as souvenirs. <laughs> in 1895, the bell traveled to Atlanta for the Cotton States and Atlantic Exposition, and today there is a replica of it in Georgia Plaza Park. In 1902, the bell went to Charleston for the Interstate and West Indian Exposition. In 1903, the bell traveled to Boston to take part in the celebration of the Battle of Bunker Hill. And in 1904, the bell went to St. Louis for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. In 1908, shown here, it was paraded through the streets of Philadelphia to celebrate Founders Week. And by this time, it was considered worse as far as the crack and that souvenirs had deprived it of a little over 1% of its weight, some 20 or 30 pounds. People 
loved having their pictures taken with the bell. So all kinds of civic groups would pose with it. And they'd get all dressed up and stand next to the bell. Famous people loved having their picture taken with the bell. Here's Thomas Edison, and another one was Chief Little Bear. They loved having pictures with kids and the bell. I'm not kidding you, there are dozens of these, and they're mostly of crying kids. <laughs> Dressed as Uncle Sam or Lady Liberty or something, and he's crying, and he's crying, and she's not crying, but just wait. <laughs> Here they are unloading the bell. I'm sure that didn't cause further damage. <laughs> in 1915, it traveled to San Francisco for the Panama Pacific Exposition. Philadelphia city officials were initially very reluctant to send it again because of all the traveling and handling previously, uh, they were worried about the damage to it. But ultimately, there was a petition signed by several hundred thousand school children uh, who helped sway the officials to allow the bell to travel once more. And there is the trip that it took. It went over 10,000 miles on this trip, stopped in many towns along the way. It went back by a different route down through the south so that the uh, maximum number of people could see it because that was the final rail journey across the country. In 1970, it was mounted, in 1917, it was mounted on a truck and driven through the streets of Philadelphia uh, to promote World War I Liberty Bonds. Bonds buy bullets, buy bonds. In 1926, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of independence, microphones were placed around the bell to broadcast the sound on the radio. And at midnight on New Year's Eve in Philadelphia, it was struck with a special mallet by the mayor's wife. In June 1944, D-Day, the bell was tapped with a rubber mallet 12 times in Philadelphia by Mayor Bernard Samuel during a national radio program, and then seven times more to spell out the word liberty. In 1976, to celebrate the bicentennial, the Liberty Bell was moved from Independence Hall to a pavilion across the street, which allowed visitors to view the bell at any time during the day, and of course to aggravate the uh, famous James McCloskey. <laughs> However, in 2001, it was attacked by a vandal uh, with a hammer, and he managed to put some dents in it before being wrestled to the ground, but the dents were later repaired. And in October 2003, the new Liberty Bell Center, costing $12.6 was open to the public, and there it is today, now under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. It's outreach of the public. <laughs> You're not allowed to touch it any longer, and it's hung by what is believed to be its original yoke. The Liberty Bell is 12 feet in diameter, and lip to crown is 3 feet, the crack is 2 feet 4 inches and a half wide, and it's tuned to the key of E flat. There are duplicates of the Liberty Bell. In 1915, an exact duplicate named the Justice Bell was forged to promote women's suffrage. It traveled through the country with its clapper chained to the side, silent until women won the right to vote. Uh, on September 25, 1920, that bell was brought to Independence Hall and rung in ceremonies celebrating the ratification of the 19th Amendment. It hangs today at the Washington Memorial Chapel in Valley Forge. Another exact reproduction is the Normandy Bell, which was cast by a Frenchman in gratitude to commemorate the 60th anniversary in 2004 of the Allied invasion to Normandy. It was rung at the cemetery in France where Americans and other Allied soldiers are buried, and it was first rung in the United States on July 4th, 2005, outside the Liberty Bell Center on Independence Mall, and it now hangs at the George W. Bush Library. This is my favorite. This final slide has nothing to do with the Liberty Bell, but it has everything to do with Liberty. What you're looking at is a picture of the dock in Dusseldorf, Germany, and these are bells from cathedrals all over here, and you can see how massive it is. These are cathedrals all over Europe, they have taken down the bells. And they were in the process, along with other metal, as has happened in history before, of melting them down into munitions. Mm -hmm. But before they could destroy them, the Americans had swooped in, crushed the resistance, the war had ended, they had taken over the base. I love a happy ending, and here it is. Fact. <laughs> all of those bells were identified and returned to their rightful places. Yeah. <laughs> they were returned.
learned, uh, along with other articles stolen by the Nazis, uh, by men whose mission it was to get them back to the original owners, and I'd look at that picture and think, you know, well, they ought to make a movie out of that. Well, guess what they have? It's supposed to be out this month, but I haven't seen any advertisements. It's starring George Clooney, and it's called The Monument Men. It's a true story, and I suggest you go see it, because I certainly will. Any questions? I mean, yes? Uh, you may have said this, but is uh, the Liberty Bell still run at all? No. It's in this case, I guess, now, um, as you mentioned. It's out of reach, it's, so is it in yeah, a, it's kind it's, it's, uh, it's way high. Yeah, it's up. You, you would be looking up into it, so. Um, and as you can see from, from the supports, I mean, they're just trying to preserve it. So, no, you, you can't, and I, and the thing is they've got so many duplicates now that are exact duplicates of it that they, they sometimes ring. I mean, if you wanted to hear what it, it sounded like. Oh, you can go on the internet, and there's, like, the Liberty Bell Center, they have a little icon that you can click on, and it will, will give you the sound of an E-flat bell, so you can hear what the Liberty Bell would have sounded like if, if you were ringing it. And, and like I say, they have a number of duplicates that, that they could use for that. So if you want to see what it sounded like, uh, you can press on that in the name. And I did, which <laughs> makes me happy, because I love bells. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, if Whitechapel or their whatever the yeah. company was called at the time, this is the bell they made, and then I see Cass and Stowe's name on this. So did they put their name on it and they tried to? No, they put on it um, just what uh, Isaac Stowe, as a representative, had sent to Robert Charles to put on the bell. So in other words, um, they just put uh, Cass and Stowe. Yeah, what? Well, you know, Cass and Stowe added their name. They yeah. were the Americans. Yeah. Right, yeah. So I guess they were trying to take pride of place. Okay, and, so this is the original bell. The original bell didn't have it on there. Yeah. And I, yeah. I don't know that it said White Chapel on it somewhere. Yeah. They might have struck that out and put, oh no, it's past the step. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but you said they melted it down and recast it. Uh -huh. So they would have put their name on when they recast it. Yeah. yeah. Did they melt the entire thing down or just repair the part? Well, it kind of sounds like they didn't do an entire melt, and, and being an iron foundry without the equipment to right. to do a bell, as, you know, as you saw yeah. in the earlier one, what it looks like when they're casting bells. I don't think they would have had the room to do that. Yeah. But they were they were probably remelting maybe parts of it, maybe the rim where it had cracked, and okay. adding stuff to it. Um, but they certainly would have had the equipment to melt out the part and put their name in there. So. Okay. So you're saying that battles like this, it's a dying art, they don't make them anymore? Oh yeah, White Chapel still makes bells. And, and I think, you know, America's kind of a little more disposable than Europe. As I say, in, in Europe, uh, if they find that one is cracked or there's metal fatigue for some reason, they take them down, take them to whatever foundry, maybe White Chapel, and they recast that exact same bell. So, when you have a peel of bells, they're of course tuned to different ones. So if the little bell had cracked, they would take that down, recast it at the exact same tune or tone, and put it right back. But that's the thing that fascinated me is that uh, I had wondered, oh, what did the bells sound like back in those times? But but they still have them. They're just recast, but they use the same metal. So hmm. yeah. Anything else? Yes. When they ordered it. Did they say they wanted a flat, or did that? That's just what they were sent. Um, well, in the material where he sent that, he asked for about a, a good bell of about 2,000 pounds. So I don't know that they specifically ordered that key. They just wanted a big bell so that they could hear it over a large area. Because the city had grown and they, they wanted everybody to know when it was time to gather around and do whatever they were doing. Anything else?